What's up, my Golden Era family? And for those that don't know who I am, my name is James, Craze the King of Content Billings, director and creator of the original series, The Untold Stories Up. Now, in this exclusive clip, I'm breaking down the history of the independent label Tommy Boy. And that history is broken down by no other than the former president of Tommy Boy Records, Monica Lynch. Now, in this exclusive phone conversation that I had with her, she's going to break down the history of Tommy Boy, the artist, African Bambata, New York Radio, and the perception of how hip hop was taken in the earlier days. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. what I can, but like I said, I mean, I, I know it's been <laughs> you know, a while. Instant recall going back to the '80s is, uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I'm sure I won't be able to recall everything with 100% clarity, but no, that's we'll fine. Try. That's fine. We'll we'll take what you know suits the story the best. So, tell me how you. Uh, you know, I'll start off by asking you your your position at the time and how you got into music. Uh, well, my position at Tommy Boy at the time that Seth came was I was just, I was vice president and I was just about to be named president, which happened in 1986. Mm. And Seth started with Tommy Boy a year earlier than that, 1985. Uh, and there's, I'm from Chicago and, uh, you know, did a lot of things back in the day, disco, punk, hanging out at the Mud Club in Studio 54 when I came here in 78, mm -hmm. just all sorts of crazy stuff. But I, I'm i giving you the condensed version. You can look it up online. There's, you know, information about it. But, mm -hmm. the, um, but uh, basically I started working. I was the first employee of Tommy Boy starting in uh, December of 1981. Mm. So at that time, hip hop was kind of, it was established in the 70s, but it was getting established more on a, I guess, a mainstream level or, or artists. Well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say it was established in the 70s. It was still very much, I mean, save for, you know, Rapper's Delight, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, but no, it really was not established. It was still very much sort of an underground thing. I mean, Rapper's Delight was sort of a phenomenon that, you know, made a lot of people say, oh, what's this rap thing? But even, you know, into the early 80s, into the mid 80s, I'd say, you know, it was um, generally not something that was remotely mainstream. Um, it was not embraced by black radio. It was not embraced uh, by major labels. It was uh, considered a bit of a disgrace to the race in, in many black music uh, industry circles. Why do you say that? Um, why would I say that? Yeah, I'm just asking. I'm curious. I don't know. But I'm well, oh, just because it's true. It was... Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, it was, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was perceived sir, as a bastard child of the black music uh, crowd that would be more interested in playing, you know, uh, a new Patti LaBelle record or some smoothed out, you know, smooth jazz thing. Um, you know, hip hop was not uh, embraced. It was like, you know, black music had a very bougie, uh, thing going on and hip hop you know street music coming up from the street it wasn't really I think it was perceived as a fad that would pa you know would fade and um, and you know was it that way across the board no but was it that way by and large yes um, New York was a very um was and oh has always been a unique market um, because y you know in the early 80s you did have well first of all you know Magic Supreme Team Awesome Two right. some of the college shows those were the that's where that's where you were getting radio play and in clubs you know roller rinks and clubs I'm telling you stuff I'm sure you well, you well know but yeah. the um, 
you know, in terms of getting morning airplay on drive time, that was, you know, took quite, it took a while for that to happen. And then when it did, it really had to be records that, you know, crossed all party lines. Um, like say Planet Rock right. became one of those records. But uh, again, you know, you know, you had this scene sort of bursting out of New York and spreading into the mid-Atlantic states and, and, and you know, you had the unique s- scenario of having K-Day in Los Angeles with Greg Mack going full-time, you know, practically full-time hip-hop. Right. And, you know, the Miami uh, scene before there was Miami based, you know, Miami was a very receptive market. But, you know, uh, what made New York unique is that you had an ultra competitive uh, triumvirate of WBLS, KISS, and WKTU that were all going for the, the urban listeners, yeah. uh, KTU leaning leaning into the Spanish listeners more than the other two, BLS with Frankie doing his, you know, Frankie thing, uh, you know, because he was always mixing things up, you know, he'd play everything from Santana and Frank Sinatra to, you know, Peach Boys and Planet Rock. And then you had Barry Mayo and Tony Gray uh, kids who were, you know, really uh, wanted to make their mark, and they were hugely competitive, and they had the lunch mix and master mixes and all this stuff. Kiss and BLS maybe had, all three of them, all three of them were on fire, and as such, I think it served, you know, the emerging hip-hop scene well, because not only was it in their own backyard, but it could be used as a, a wedge to, you know... Um, bring in listeners and they all they all needed to be ultra responsive to what was happening in the clubs what was happening on the streets what was selling in the stores uh and you know uh i'm sure as you also know that it wasn't like either of those stations overnight decided hey we need to have a hip-hop show it took a couple years right. you know before you know and then magic did go to bls and kiss who actually you know i, I know this because you know both barry and and red have acknowledged it they had actually asked me for advice on a dj because they'd gone through you know i forget who the who came before red but there were a couple other folks from Z- the zulu nation that Bam was always touring, and I think either Islam or Wizkid, I, I mean, not Wizkid, uh, Jazzy J, mm-hmm. were uh, considered as well, but I don't think that they could handle the, the regular, uh, I don't know if they wanted to do the regular grind, and I don't think it paid. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so I did suggest Red, and that worked out well for him and, right. uh, and for Kiss. But, you know, that was when, when did, when did Red go to... Kiss was it 83, 84? I don't know. Somewhere and, in that, and, somewhere in that area. Yeah, and, and and Magic was on HBI for you know uh, it took it, it took a minute before Frankie or you know gave him a job over at BLS. So what I'm saying is that it's not like this uh, culture burst on the scene fully formed or fully accepted. Right. You know, it had been incubating, clearly incubating and thriving and doing, you know, very culturally rich, but it wasn't, uh, the gatekeepers were not uh, readily letting hip-hop in the door in the early to mid-80s, and even past then, you know, it depends. There's, of course, there's a lot of factors, but but generally speaking, I don't know, you know, if you're from New York, but... Yeah, I'm from New York. Okay, so then, you know, if you were around back then, you know that it's, uh, you know the story. Right. Some of it, I was I was a lot younger, and so, mm-hmm. you know, um, <clears throat> my perception is way different from yours. <laughs> right, well, good. You know, I'm glad it's good that there's different perceptions. You know, my right. perception is of someone who was had just recently sort of jumped into the the scene, and you know, uh, and you know, so I had a different vantage point. Right. Um, you know, from the industry side of things, and.
and um, anyway. That's, so, uh, no, that's fine. And, and I love that <clears throat> you're elaborating on the question because it gives me a lot to kind of choose from. Uh-huh. So that that's that's great. Um, so uh-huh. you said in 86 you were vice president and heading to being president. Uh, I was a, in 85 I was vice president. 85. I was named president in 86. Right. So at Which that, was a big deal back then. <laughs> right, right, right. I get it. And so at this particular time, what made Tommy Boy dive into hip hop? What made you guys dive into hip hop? Well, Tom uh, had been had started a uh, disco DJ tip sheet um, circa, he started it maybe around 79 or so. It was called Dance Music Report. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And Yeah, and so he was uh, doing, he was publishing Dance Music Report for disco DJs, and, uh, you know, he was a big sort of, you know, originally, I believe Tom was a doo-wop fan, sort of mutated into a disco fan. Mm-hmm. And then when hip-hop started, um, I know he became interested in that, and shortly before, and he uh, wanted to have, you know, launch his own label. Um, and I should really let you get that entire backstory from him, because I won't do it justice. But the gist of it is, is that... When I came in 9th, December of 81, he had put out a couple of, maybe a handful of records. Mm-hmm. Bon Rock and Cotton Candy was one of them, and I forget what else. Nothing had really hit. Um, uh, you know, but, the, but this emerging rap market presented a lot of opportunity for an independent label, because that's all the labels that were putting out rap. Um, were the were the independent labels? So it was sort of like it was a territory that the labels were compl- the major labels were completely sleeping on, and um, so the indies could get in there and you know do 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 business. Right. Um, and when I first arrived at Tommy Boy, the big record that was just emerging, it was sort of like the first real hit on Tommy Boy. It wasn't a huge hit, but it was a hit was um, Jazzy Sensation. Mm. You know, Bambata. And, right. uh, yeah, so, um, you know, so I think it was a, a combination of opportunity and, and, and you know, just the interest in that music. And then I think really when Tom and Arthur Baker, you know, and... Uh, connected and again you should talk to Tom and get all the details from him but really um, meeting Bambata uh, connecting with Arthur the whole situation with Bam playing craft work uh, the connection with John Roby through Arthur all of it culminated in Planet Rock which was you know the first huge 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 breakthrough hit for Tommy Boy and it was a game changer and it was a very um, it was enormous it was hugely influential it was a record that crossed a lot of different genre lines you know you could hear it at you know Bentley's and Leviticus as well as hearing it at the Roxy or Danceteria or the Funhouse and you know, everybody just, it was, it, was an, it was an electro record and it really was electrifying because when that record hit, you know, you could just be walking around the city and hear it coming out of cars, coming out of boom boxes. I mean, it exploded. It exploded. Right. So that leads me to the next set of groups or... Well, was... you know, we're supposed to be really focusing on stick because if we, go, if you want to go into all of the, no, 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 not all of them. I'm okay. just, I'm leading to the. Okay. We're gonna focus on stick, but I'm, okay. I'm finishing okay. the question. So it, it led you guys to sign, uh, signing the next set of groups. One. Yeah, well, there was a so, so the early era of Tommy Boy was sort of the electro era, right? And that was, you know, Africa Bambada and Sulfonic Force, 
uh, Globe and Whiz Kid play that beat. The Johnson Crew, which was, uh, you know, interesting because even though they weren't from New York and they sort of wore powdered wigs and (laughs) had a whole type of thing that they did, they actually did very, very well in marketplaces where some of our other stuff didn't hit as as big. Like, you know, they were huge in Dallas and all these other places because Houston, you know, space is the place and all that stuff. Space Cowboy was huge there. Um, and uh, Planet Patrol um, was really huge. Um, so it was sort of this uh, really brief and shining period between, say, 81 to maybe, I don't know, 84 or, or so when Electro was really a big thing and there were a lot of other groups that were sort of imitating you know the planet rock sound or doing their own sort of electro things in original ways you know like say strafe and stuff like that i don't know exactly when strafe came out maybe it was a little later but um uh anyway so then i would say when and I, this is where the chronology you'd have to really check it but but i'd say the electro sound hit very fast and hard, and it also uh, diminished pretty quickly when the Run DMC sound came out. Right. And uh, with a much harder, more aggressive, much more uh, down tempo uh, sound. I mean, Planet Rock, I think, was maybe 120, you know, beats, BPM. Right. Uh, you know, all that up tempo electro stuff. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it entirely fell by the wayside, but the Run DMC sound just, uh, you know, uh, ushered in a new, a new sound right. that became uh, enormously dominant. So that was like, you know, I would say that was the dominant sound of the mid '80s. Right. Um, and c- coupled with countless records that sampled James Brown. Right. Funky drummer and such. So, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, so I was just going to say, uh, you know, the other group that we had prior, that was making noise prior to Stet coming along was Force MDs. In the sunshine, let me hold you, baby, all night. Let me touch you in the moonlight. Let me love you, gonna make you all mine. wasn't another group that was like for some D's, you know, the combination of doo-wop and hip-hop. Now, I say there was no other group that was quite like that, but in fact, <laughs> New Edition came along yeah. and sort of had uh, some of those same elements, and of course, they were, you know, also um, exploded, but also then went, you know, because of the fact that they were a boy group and everything like that, they went through... A litigious but uh, gener- but very successful transition from an indie label, which was, uh, you know, uh, on Arthur's label, um, uh, what was it, Streetwise? And then they went the major label route and had a lot of, you know, sort of got embraced by the, the mainstream R&B right. world. But um, Four MDs had a very, uh, had a lot of hits in New York and other places. And in fact, they were the first artist that um, 
we had that had um, such tremendous uh, success with a hit single with Tender Love. Right. Um, that was the, uh, you know, top, it was a top 10 pop single, which was uh, pretty much unheard of for you know, <laughs> most of the stuff coming out of the hip hop label scene back then. Um, and I believe it went to, I think it was number one on the R&B chart too. That was an unusual situation because um, what happened there, and it signaled a very big shift in the Tommy Boy story. Um, the reason, Force and Deeds had had success with, you know, um, Tears and um, uh, da, 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 Love is a House. Well, Love is a House is late, a little later. Right. Um, let Me Love You. Yeah, let Me Love You. Uh, it's in first scratch. Uh, yeah. They had a bunch. Of, they had, a, you know, they had hits that uh, were getting radio play and doing well. Um, but what happened is there was this movie that was being made called Crush Groove. Right. And. Um, it was uh, produced by um, Doug McHenry and George Jackson, and I was close with both of them. In fact, I was dating Doug at the time, and, um, you know, the whole story was sort of a thinly veiled bio of, uh, you Russell. know. Huh? Was it a bio? Russell, Russell and, Rick. and Rick. Right. Yeah. And... Um, they had, uh, they were shooting it in New York. They had a, a, an, a soundtrack. The deal for the soundtrack album was with Warner Brothers. And um, uh, they had Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis on board to produce a record that was supposed to be recorded by New Edition. And I'd been lobbying to have Force MDs on the album t for to no avail. I was so <laughs> disappointed. You know, because at the time, New Edition was the big name. Right. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, so they had everything locked in for the soundtrack. I forget who else was on there. But... Um, at the 11th hour and 59th minute, New Edition, for reasons that had to do with uh, legal issues that they were going through, because they had a very weird, you know, they, they had a bunch of litigious things going on in their right. early career, and I can't remember the half of it, but the point of it is, is that the track was written, Jimmy Jam and Terry were ready to go to have New Edition record it, and then New Edition couldn't do it. And so Doug called me and said, can you get 4SMDs up to Minneapolis tomorrow to do this track? And so that was, that flipped everything because, um, uh, you know, it was like all hands on deck, moved every, <laughs> anything that can or could, you know, could have been done to get those guys on a plane and up to Minneapolis to record. I'm like, I don't care what this is happening. So we had to, everyone had to move super, super fast. And in fact, the, the song was Tender Love. Mm. And, and, uh, uh, the, what came out of that, which is why I'm giving you the, you know, the scenic root version. Oh of no, I love it. That, I love it. This is history. I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's you know, it's it's not a. Well, anyway, the point is, is that Crush Groove, the Crush Groove soundtrack was on Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers had a hit. Now had a hit with Tender Love, and it also it dovetailed rather nicely into the fact that Tommy Boy, if Warner Brothers was interested in getting into the hip hop market. Tommy Boy uh, was looking into you know, the scenario of having a deal with Warner Brothers where 
a hit like Tender Love could be, you know, properly marketed and promoted to radio in a way that an independent label really wouldn't be able to do, and was bringing, you know, some, and also brought financial security to Tommy Boy at a time when, you know, uh, we weren't as red hot as we had been in the early 80s. We were sort of in this transition period. Right. And so a deal was made with Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers, uh, you know, got like, I forget exactly what the percent, but they basically got half the company and Tom had the other half of the company. And uh, so a partnership was born out of Tender Love. Nice. It, had it not been for Tender Love, none of that would have gone down. Or it wouldn't have gone down when it went down or how it went down, let's put it that way. Right. So, um, so yeah, it, 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 there, a lot of stuff came out of uh, that one track. Now that you've seen that exclusive clip, I need you to go to my exclusive link in the description or the bio, wherever you're watching my content at, and make sure you click on that link to stream all my exclusive content from my documentary series to other exclusive content that I don't even put on YouTube or anywhere else. I thank y'all for watching. Stay blessed and let's get it. Until next time, Crazes out.